Okay. Dear colleagues and friends, welcome to Image OptiNerve, Laminal Pyrosa, and Retina in Glaucoma Session. My name is Shulan Zhang. I'm very happy to co chair mm -hmm. with uh, Professor Kiho Pa and Linda Lin Vail, but the Linda and Vail could not make it this time. In this session, we are delighted to invite seven speakers who have contributed in the field of glaucoma imaging to share their achievements today. Each speaker supposed to have 12 minutes, including presentation nine minutes and Q&A maybe three minutes. After every speech, the audience may have several minutes to ask the questions. So let's begin now. Welcome the first speaker, Professor Gaspillo de Morris. Thank you for the opportunity to be here talking about practical recommendations for imaging in glaucoma. These are my disclosures, some of which may be relevant to the content of this presentation. I'm going to be focused on the recommendations of the consensus for glaucoma progression developed by the World Glaucoma Association. Uh, in summary, this was a consensus in which we discussed methods and importance of detecting functional progression, structural, incorporating structure and function for progressing, as well as risk assessments. For the purpose of this talk, I'll be focusing mostly on the three last aspects here, which are structural progression with OCT. Uh, combining structure and function and the importance of risk assessments. So as far as structural progression, it has become pretty evident today that OCT is our gold standard to assess structural changes in a more objective fashion. Of course, these photos are also helpful, but they don't provide the level of objectivity and quantification that OCT does. And the two main parameters that we'd be looking at, or the two main scans we're interested in are is the one around the optic nerve, focus on the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, and the macula focus on the retinal ganglion cell uh, layer thickness. Uh, these were the results of the AIG or advanced imaging study in which they compared the likelihood of detecting progression comparing visual fields and OCT. And as you can see here, uh, patients were more likely to, more likely to experience uh, progressive visual field change with OCT, or mini a structural parameter than the visual field, which is one of the reasons this technology has become so important for us in the management of glaucoma. Uh, and also what's interesting is that within the OCT parameters, there was a trend for more cases of progression detected in the macular ganglion cell uh, layer as opposed to or compared with the retinal nerve fiber layer which does not say that the MAC is more important, but shows how important it is to combine the two parameters when looking for progression. Uh, in fact, uh, as they show here, uh, when comparing OCT with visual fields, there was a significant uh, earlier detection of progression uh, with OCT in patients with established visual field loss. And uh, this was highly important for uh, prognostication of these patients. Uh, one recommendation for assessment of structural progression is to always employ event and trend-based methods. What does it mean? So both looking at the rate or speed of progression, but also having a binary definition of progression, yes or no, are important for a structural assessment in glaucoma with OCT. Another important point is always to look at global as well as local metrics when looking for progression they're compl complementary and we will probably miss a lot of cases of progression if we don't combine the two. And what do I mean by that? So this is the, pro the report from one of the manufacturers in which we have a set of two baseline tests and then the follow-up using the optic nerve head uh, scans. Uh, what you can see here is that compared to baseline at this scan, these areas in yellow suggest some progression in the superior and lower inferior part of the optic nerve, which were later confirmed in a subsequent event. So here I have an event. So I say here that this patient probably experienced progression at this point and confirmed at a later point. It's also important to look at the rate that this patient is progressing. So such change could be uh, not as important if it happened over 10 years, say, as opposed to happening over a shorter period of time. So the rate 
or the slope is very important for us. So here, for example, you see that this patient is progressing relatively fast at 2.3 microns per year in this period of time. Uh, we also are able to look at that, looking at the superior part, the inferior part of the retina under the fiber layer, and we can also look at the cup to this ratio. What I find particularly important is to look at the topographical map and see where that change is occurring. As we know, glaucoma tends to affect mostly the superior and inferior poles of the disc, so I tend to look for changes in those locations, which are more meaningful for progression, in my opinion. Uh, changes in the nasal part of the disc are not that characteristic of glaucoma if, happen in, if they happen in isolation. So in this case here, you see that the superior temporal and the inferior temporal parts of the disc are suggestive of progression, which makes, me, which makes me a lot more confident that this is true and not just artifact or noise from test retest. Uh, as opposed to this patient here in which the two baseline tests and the follow-up tests are pretty similar and stable and uh, no changes occur in either location of the disc, uh, which also makes me confident that this patient is stable. Uh, as I said, looking at the macula is important. Another example here, we can also look at uh, an event-based and a trend-based analysis of progression. In both cases, this patient appears to be stable. But also it's important to look at individual scans. So if you, uh, in some patients, you may not see that much change occurring in the statistical analysis, but looking at it qualitatively and taking into account the topographical nature of glaucoma, you see that between these two scans in this patient, there was some significant uh, thinning of the inferior macula as opposed to the previous tests. So in the absence of multiple tests to look for trend analysis or event analysis, it's recommended to look at individual scans and compare where progression occurred and if it matches other tests, such as visual fields. Uh, another important message is, that, message is that statistically significant change should take into account if that change exceeds test retest variability and also what we call age-related or physiologic change. Uh, as we know, these are factors that can affect our interpretation of progression. And the question is always, what's the clinically significant progression with OCT? For which we don't have a clear answer, but we have some uh, suggestion of what we should consider significant. In this paper by Medeiros and colleagues, for example, the average rate of RNFL progression with OCT is approximately 0.5 microns per year. So one could use that as a, as a rule of thumb in terms of defining when progression is beyond that from aging itself. Uh, but this results in a lot of false positive results. So in addition to that, they propose that to be more specific or lower our false positive rates, a rate of, a rate of progression of 0.9 microns per year may be uh, more use, useful when defining progressive cases. Uh, another point of question is always how often should we do we doing OCT? Uh, the current recommendation is that probably there's not much benefit of doing more than twice a year. I, I think uh, for patients with low risk, such as those who are followed, who have normal discs, uh, normal pressures, no other significant risk factors, aside from, let's say, a family history of glaucoma, if everything is fine over uh, our baseline examination, they could be tested every year. For patients who have a higher risk of developing glaucoma uh, or those who have established glaucoma, uh, it's recommended or at least uh, it's probably better to do twice, two tests per year. So you do your first one and then every six months thereafter. Uh, but always be careful when testing these patients. Uh, there's, there's an issue with uh, advanced disease in which we may not be able to detect progression if we use global metrics. And apparently using macular scans may be better. The global metrics reach a floor, uh, which is an issue in advanced glaucoma, but apparently the floor of the macular ganglion cell thickness is reached much further, allowing us to follow these patients later. This is a nice study uh, by Levinsky and colleagues in which they looked at patients with very advanced glaucoma and they found that because of that floor effect, we could barely see any progression uh, on, on the retina nerve fiber layer scans around the optic nerve, as you can see by the event and trend-based analysis here. However, when you look at the macula, you start seeing some progression that was not detected uh, with the RNFL, 
and which is consistent with the rate of progression of the visual field. So always consider uh, using the macula in your patients, particularly among those who have advanced disease. As far as structure and function, the message is always combine the two. Uh, they are not always going to agree. Uh, if they agree, it gives you more certainty. Uh, if they don't agree, look at other clinical parameters, such as pressure, uh, risk factors, and uh, uh, the likelihood that these patients may be experience functional progression alone or structural progression alone before the other. It's an example from my clinic, a patient that if you look at the average RNFL analysis, it's suggesting progression, but the change is mostly scattered over time. It's not like a specific pattern of progression and mostly around the nasal part of the disc, which is not characteristic of glaucoma. Uh, here, as you can see again, progression in the nasal inferior part of the disc is not really characteristic, even though the rate of progression here seems to be statistically significant. The macula also does not show progression, so uh, you will not expect a nasal uh, progression consistent with the macula, and as you can see here, and also uh, no progressive changes in the fellow eye. Visual fields are also stable, so when you combine visual field data and OCT data, the visual fields are stable, but the OCT suggests some progression. So in this case, I know that the patient has very, pressures are very well controlled, plus the information that this progression in the RNFL does not really match a progression where we usually see glaucoma, makes me very confident that this is probably just noise and I can continue to follow this patient without adding any other drugs or doing surgery. And the same thing here for the fellow eye. We have recently reported a new way to combine structure and function in glaucoma and following the two together. I recommend that you read our paper in the IOVS and TVST this past month. Uh, but for those of you who do not have that and will take some time to be available, it's very easy to look at that information looking at individual scans. So I brought an example of a patient whose baseline visual field was normal. I believe most of us would really confirm that this is normal. And as we follow this patient over time, you see some points fluctuating uh, in the right eye, some of them the nasal region or paracentral region, until at some point around 20 months, you see this established effect that is confirmed. Here you see the baseline and follow-up scan, something going on in the superior nasal part of the visual field. Is this true or not? Well, when you look at the OCT for structure and functional corroboration, the inferior temporal part of the disc of the RNFL, as shown here, shows a defect even when the visual field was normal in that so-called macular vulnerability zone. And as we fall over time that location, you may notice that it continues to decrease or get thinner, uh, and which is consistent with that area that we saw in the visual field. So it's very important to combine structure and function, particularly when you're not sure if one uh, is noise or just variability. As far as risk assessment, always take those factors in consideration, not only to determine if the patient is progressing, but also how frequently you should be testing these patients. There's a risk calculator from the ocular hypertension treatment study for those who are ocular hypertensives without glaucoma, and the risk calculator for patients with glaucoma that we developed here in New York. Thank you for the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share with you the pills and peaceful of optical coherence tomography. My name is Xu Lan Zhang, came from Zhongshan Ophthalmy Center, Sun Yat-sen University, Guangzhou, China. I don't have finance disclosure. As you all know, OCT from TD to SD to SSOCT, more faster skin speed, more stronger penetration, and more clear image. OCT can provide not only structure, but functional information. Now let's talk about the pills and peaceful of ASOCT in glaucoma first. ASOCT are widely used in the diagnosis and grading of the angle culture. It can provide clear imaging and precisely measurement the anterior chamber angle, 
And Casio OCT, this is SSOCT, has more functional tests than Vicentis OCT, and this is TDOCT. From this figure, you can see the ASOCT has outstanding performance of the AOD and TSA in angle classification. And ASOCT can precisely clear image the SNES canal and do the biometric analysis. And he also can do three-dimensional scan of the uh, anterior chamber area. From this figure, you can see there's a gate between narrow and open angle. That means volumetric perimeters, that is anterior chamber volume ACV, also demonstrated excellent diagnostic performance of the angle quotient. However, ASOCT cannot locate the scale spur in the ASOCT scan. And this is very important to classify open and narrow angle. And also the ciliary body cannot seen in the ASOCT. And this is very important to grading the angle configuration. So faster scanning speed and larger image area and clear imaging of the blood vessel and post trabecular outflow pathway and lens opacity classification based on ASOCT are needed to improve in the future. Now let's talk about the posterior segment OCT in glaucoma. SD OCT can precisely image the retinal layer and SS OCT can clear image the laminal pyrosa. And also, SSOCT can give 3D wide field scan of the retina. And the SLCT can also clear image the choroid, which my team have been done a lot of work in this field. However, since OCT, even though OCT has been widely used in glaucoma diagnosis, glaucoma patient has seen the retinal nerve fiber layer, RNFL, and ganglion cell inner passive layer, GCIP health. However, what is the real thinning of the RNFL and GCIP health? Actually, several factors can may affect the image quality, such as signal quality, scan alignment, opacity, segmentation error, and aging. From this figure, you can see AUC increase with better scan signal and scan signal influence both RNFL and GCIPL perimeters. And the various displacement of OCT scan can affect the RNFL signals, especially in the higher myopic eyes because of this tail and the torsion. And cataract and palpi papillary which is opacity can influence the uh, measurement of RNFL signals in the localized area. And automated segmentation area results in abnormal global RNFL signals and may overestimate the classification of glaucoma. So manual refinement of the segmentation may improve the diagnosis performance. From this figure, you can see average RNFL and GCIPL signals statistically significantly decrease with in increasing age. So global change of RNFL and GCIPL due to the effect of age should be considered when assessing the eye over the time. So several problems should be improved in the future for the uh, po uh, posterior segment OCT. Uh, the, one of the, the one is the problem of the OCT imaging in the higher myopic eyes. The another one is to increase the resolution of the deep tissue and clearly image the deep layer and the structures such as boundary, lower boundary of the laminal quibosa and the core. In the future, can we segment GCIPL into GCL and IPL independently? Now let's talk about a little bit OCTA in glaucoma. 
OCTA have been widely used in glaucoma diagnosis. And glaucoma patients have reduced vessel density in the optic disc and macular region. This is the quantitative analysis of OCTA matrix in the macular region. And this is quantitative analysis of OCTA matrix in the optic disc region. The same several factors may affect the signal quality when we're reading the OCTA image, such as signal quality, scan centration, opacities, and segmentation area. This figure shows signal strains significantly affect the parafovia and peripapillary microvascular density, and poor sensation may cause incorrect estimation of sectoral and average vessel density. And lens opacity have a significant influence on quantitative vessel analysis. A missegmentation of retinal layer and consequent vessel density measurement error occur in about one third of the healthy eyes. The segmentation error should be checked and manually correct. And previous OCTA skin area is three times three uh, millimeter, which is relatively small. And we don't have too much data about vessel density of this area. So larger skin area in the macular and even of this region may provide more information about the vessel density on this area. The signal strength of OCTA image in deep retina and coral layer are worse than the superficial layer. So precisely estimated the vessel density in the deeper layer of the coral is lead to improve and which will, ben will benefit the variation of the DR, AMD and glaucoma. So let me summary, OCT provides of both structure and functional information. And OCT are widely used in a tail and posterior segment image of glaucoma. And OCTA is useful in evaluation and grading of the microvasculature. And going wider and deeper is leading in OCT and OCTA skinning of the glaucoma subject. Thank you very much. everyone, this is Kyung Lim Song and I'm, today I'm going to speak about what we have to know about optic disc imaging in myopic glaucomatous eyes. Myopia is reported as a risk factor for a development of primary opening glaucoma in many studies. We do not know exactly why, but myopia experiences axial elongation and subsequently optic disc and retinal fiber layer, which is the target of glaucomatous damage, is affected by such a change. Then we may ask, uh, is myopic glaucomatous optic disc different from non-myopic glaucomatous optic disc? Uh, several tools are used for the diagnosis of glaucoma. Optic disc RNFL photographs are the mainstay. And about two decades ago, OCT has been introduced in the diagnosis of glaucoma by looking at the RNFL and macula. And recently, lamina cribrosa and uh, uh, vascular density has been also imaged by OCT. Firstly, uh, when we looked optic disc and RNFL photographs, one of the key features in myopic optic disc is peripapillary atrophy. This is not always found, but frequent in myopic glaucoma, and the shapes are very different. Usually, the shape of peripapillary atrophy is determined by the location of square thinning around uh, optic disc. And such area of square thinning around the optic disc causes a tilted and rotated shape of optic disc. So what is the implication of uh, the optic disc shape alteration in glaucoma? 
when we looked at almost 1,000 uh, of myopic optic disc, optic disc tilt was associated with more myopic error and twice more frequently observed in glaucomatocytes than normalized. Up to 70% of glaucomatocytes has optic disc tilt. But is it harmful to have optic disc tilt in glaucoma patients? Regarding the risk factor for glaucomatous visual field operation, evidence-based review showed more myopic refractive error was not was unlikely to fall the visual field operation factor. So we compared both eyes within the same patient, same patient uh, more myopic eyes and less myopic eyes. And the prevalence, prevalence of uh, the glaucomatous progression between more and less progression eyes was not different. Then we investigated the effect of optic disc tilt in the progression of glaucoma. And interestingly, optic disc tilt was protective against glaucomatous progression. Hence, the implication of the optic disc tilt and its clinical significance should be explored in the forthcoming study. Now let's talk about OCT in myopic glaucomatous optic disc. Usually, we are referring circumpapillary RNFL thickness when using OCT for glaucoma diagnosis. But sometimes, circumpapillary measurements are disturbed by peripapillary area atrophy, and thus its measurements are not usable. Some researchers recommended to use macular images. Sorry. Some re uh, researchers recommended to use macular images uh, to diagnose glaucomatous structural defect by comparing superior and inferior macular thickness, which is actually very helpful. And I'm using this tool in the cl my clinical practice. But in some cases, it is also difficult to qualify macular images in using OCT. Therefore, in such eyes with a deformed optic disc and macula in myopic eyes, it would be better to look at the optic disc more carefully to find the change rather than using unqualified OCT images. So it's really tough to examine those optic discs in highly myopic eyes. In this eyes, uh, by looking at the change of uh, vessel position uh, and the area of PPA, the progressive change could be detected. Further, elongation of posterior pull affect the distribution of circumpapillary RNFL measurements, making the peak shift to the temporal area, and this will show first uh, normative classification. So in such eyes, along with uh, normative classification, it's necessary to look at the peak level is within the normal limits or not. Glaucomatous change usually begins with the inferotemporal or superotemporal area. So it, thus, uh, early progressive change is best detected with the RNF progression analysis. But in highly myopic eyes, early change can appear near fixation area. Hence, it would be good to look at the macula along with RNFL to find the early progressive change. What about the vessel density in myopic glaucomatous eyes? When we assess the factors associated with the vessel density in glaucomatous eyes, superficial vessel density was not related, but deep vessel density was related with the myopic era. So the highly myopic eyes had reduced vascular density in deeper vessel area, deep vessel density, which may be related to thinner choroidal area, choroidal thickness. And uh, another publication reported that vessel density was associated with the PPA, peripapillary atrophy area length, and its clinical significance should be determined in the long-term observation. 
So in summary, some of myopic optic disc has a deformation and its shape was very variable. So when we look at the optic disc, glaucomatous change, we have to be very careful about the neuroretinal rim, RNFA, especially vessel positional change. OCT can be used for adjunctive tool for glaucoma diagnosis and progression detection. Uh, both RNFL and macular assessments can be used as appropriate, but it's not always to uh, acquire guaranteed images, and the disk shape alteration can affect the normative database. Uh, but however, if we have qualified images for some time, it can be well incorporated into the clinical practice. There are many efforts to investigate glaucoma pathogenesis uh, in myopic eyes using OCT and OCT angiography. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is Jinuk Jung. I'm from Seoul National University Hospital, Korea. Uh, today, my topic is progression analysis in glaucoma using macular oculis o OCT scan. Glaucoma is optic neuropathy characterized by selective loss of axons and death of retinal ganglion cells and followed by visual field defects. And this is a conventional optic disc photo and visual field examination. And recently, macular ganglion cell analysis has been introduced. So uh, macular is a multi-layered structure and the majority of the entire retinal ganglion cell population is in the macular region and variation in macular ganglion cell numbers is small. And this is why macular assessment it is important in glaucoma field. And today, I would like to talk about uh, ganglion cell layer imaging in glaucoma. What's new? And this is a recent study done by our group. The background of this study is that the macular inner retinal structure, ganglion cell inner plexiform layer, is known to have a comparable glaucoma diagnostic performances to those of the RNFL primers. However, Studies using GCI pair parameters for determining glaucoma progression has not been reported. So, so, the pur pur so the purpose of this study is to evaluate the rate of thinning in GCI pair thickness in glaucoma eyes and using a trend-based approach to determine its diagnostic ability for detecting glaucoma progression. And this is a, progr a, pr a prospective observational study with a minimum three years follow-up involving serial SDOCT measurement of GCIPL thickness. And we enrolled 65 POH patients. And we classified them into progressor and non progressor according to the serial retinal, uh, serial red free photo and or visual field examination. For calculation, the thinning rate linear regression analysis versus time was, was performed and first the collect first collect the serial OCT data from the patients second the plot the OCT data at each time point and then for calculation 
the thinning rate, linear regression analysis versus time was pro performed. We compare the GCIPR thinning rate between the affected and affected hemifields and affect unaffected hemifields. The GCIPR thinning rate was significantly faster in the temperate sector of the affected hemifield than for those of, of the unaffected hemifield. And, and this finding suggests that the thinning GCIPR thinning rate was significantly faster for the temporal GCIPR sectors of the affected hemifield than those of the unaffected hemifield. And this is the representative of, of the thinning rate of the temporal GCIPS sectors shows a good discrimination ability for glaucoma progression and correlated well with RNFL thinning rates. And spatial relationship or continuum between the affected RNFL and, re and related temporal GCIPS sectors. And this is the representative case of the progressor performed trend-based GCIPR thinning rate analysis. And progressive, op, uh, progressive localized RNF thinning and GCIPR thinning are seen in inferior hemifield. And here are the linear regression graphs of the global superior and in, in, inferior GCIPR during the follow-up period. And the rate of GCRP thinning was faster in the affected hemifield than in the in than in the unaffected hemifield. So the critical meaning of this study is that the GCRP thinning rate of the temporal sector was faster in the affected than in unaffected hemifield, suggesting that the glaucoma does damage may progress locally in a specific sequence. And trend-based analysis of GCRP thickness on OCT may be useful for assessing glaucoma progression objectively and quantitatively. And this is another study done by uh, Gyeongnim Sung Group uh, from Korea. And this is a longitudinal observation study to examine the performance of OCTGPA in detecting progressive thinning of GCIPL and RNFL in glaucoma. This is a case with POH showing progressive thinning of the GCIPL and visual field progression. Although the peripapillary RNFL already reached the measurement for And the meaning of this study so the meaning of this study is that the GCIPL GPA provides a new approach for evaluating glaucoma progression and GCIPL GPA may be more useful for detecting progression in the advanced stages of glaucoma than RNFL GPA. Now let's move on to the next topic, serial combined wide field OCT maps. And this is a recent study done by our group. And there is a there is a question is a serial analysis of combined wide field OCT maps integrating RNFL and GCRPM maps useful in detecting structural progression in patients with early glaucoma? And how about integrating the RNFL and GCRPM maps in glaucoma diagnosis? So in this study, we use the combined wide field OCT maps, panel maps, and two maps, optic disc cube and macular cube, obtained on the same day. 
integrated into one image and data sets were montaged. And this is a 53-year-old man with progressive thinning of RNFL and GCIPM maps and structural progression on RNFL guided progression analysis and GCRPL guided progression analysis, there, there was a significant progression. And also, structural progression on serial panel map was detected. And also, significant and also significant progression was detected on the serial deviation panel maps. So, and the RNFL GPA and the white field OCT map has a similar diagnostic sensitivity and specificity. So, in this study, the serial combined white field OCT maps performed well in detecting structural in structural progression in early glaucomatous eyes. So in summary, I have talked about the OCT GCRP analysis in glaucoma progression. Trend based approach for detecting glaucoma progression and GCRP GPA for detecting progression in the advanced stages of glaucoma. And also, serial analysis of combined white field OCT maps integrated the RNFL and GCIPL maps may be useful in detecting structural progression in patients with early glaucoma. Thank you so much for listening. for participating uh, in Walk Virtual Symposium today. And I am Zeynep Öztürker and I'm in clinical practice at Başkent University Hospital. And I'll be presenting optic nerve hemorrhages and what we need to know about their clinical value in glaucoma. I have no conflicts regarding this talk. Sorry. And this is where I live in Istanbul city. And this picture is from today, cotton wool clouds with a beautiful sea breeze in a beautiful summer day. And a lot of us are still socially distancing, trying to stay safe. And I hope you all are healthy and your family is healthy where you are. The relationship between glaucoma and optic disc hemorrhage um, uh, has been the subject of interest starting from the 19th century. Uh, with the clinical use of ophthalmoscopic examination. The pioneering discoveries of Bijerum and Rens have expanded our point of view about the significance of optic disc hemorrhages in glaucoma. And the accelerated research in the past 50 years have recognized the basic characteristics and factors related with disc hemorrhages, but the exact mechanism is still not fully understood. In our uh, daily practice, um, while examining the optic nerve, it is kind of being a detective searching the fingerprints to give us important clues. This is also valid for examining a disc hemorrhage. These microbleeds on the optic nerve can occur in various shapes on various regions and levels on the optic disc, but they mostly locate on some certain areas and in similar shapes that makes our work easier while seeking them. The most common locations we can find them are the inferior and superior temporal quadrants on the optic disc. These regions reminds us the startup points of a glaucoma damage on an optic nerve. And they are usually oriented perpendicular to the disc margin and extend into the adjacent retinal nerve fiber layer 
and they can be in the shapes of splinter and flame mostly, but less frequently they can be in dots or blots or diffuse forms and locate in the deeper laminar regions of the optic nerve. So while sometimes these hemorrhages are quite prominent, um, more often they are fine linear hemorrhages that run along the disc rim. At first, you may miss seeing it and mistake it for a blood vessel crossing the disc rim. But when you look closer, you will notice that the linear red line of the disc hemorrhage does not extend over the retinal surface as a blood vessel would. It is important to remember that if you just look casually at the optic nerve, you will likely miss the majority of the disc hemorrhages. The ocular hypertension treatment study showed that 84% of disc hemorrhages are missed if you don't look carefully. Uh, there are some glaucoma specific uh, features of disc hemorrhages that they frequently develop on the edge of a rim notch and a nerve fiber layer loss can be detected on the corresponding sector. I would like to mention beta zone peripapillary atrophy here as well, as their relation to these hemorrhages were demonstrated in several studies. Although these hemorrhages may persist for several weeks, the transient nature of these bleedings makes them difficult to catch, but they may be recurrent with more frequent recurrences developing in normal tension glaucoma, and most are unilateral, but they may develop bilaterally, and this too is most common in normal tension glaucoma. Numerous other conditions can cause optic disc hemorrhage, and this may lead to a glaucoma mimicking and misdiagnosis, but these other conditions typically don't have the same features of a glaucomatous neuropathy. These hemorrhages are rarely found in normal eyes, but um, they are seen in approximately six to seven percent of the eyes with glaucoma. And the prevalence in different types of glaucoma varies with the highest in normal tension glaucoma, followed by primary open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension, with the least frequency in angle closure glaucoma. That means they may occur across all the glaucoma spectrum from ocular hypertension to advanced disease. So why is a disc hemorrhage so important in glaucoma? What is the role? Major glaucoma studies have demonstrated that disc hemorrhage is an independent risk factor for glaucoma progression. And eyes with ocular hypertension that develop a disc hemorrhage are more likely to progress to a primary open angle glaucoma. After this hemorrhage, new visual field effects or a faster rate of visual field changes may occur in the follow-up of these patients. The important point here is that the patients may have no visual field effect or an early defect at the time of a disc hemorrhage, which may prevent us from being alarmed. So for this reason, a clinical optic disc examination is essential to take the necessary precautions. Why do hemorrhages occur in the process of glaucoma and what causes them? There are two likely drivers of this condition. One is mechanical disruption and the other is ischemic vascular dysregulation. Um, enhanced depth imaging OCD studies support the mechanical theory that the mechanical shearing in lamina cribrosa leads to rupture of small blood vessels resulting in a disc hemorrhage. And it is suggested that this hemorrhage is the result of an ongoing structural loss. In other theory, vascular events such as an ischemia to the optic nerve head or a damage to the blood retinal barrier may lead to the formation of a disc hemorrhage. Recent use of OCT angiography has shown that almost half of the eyes with this hemorrhages show choroidal microvascular dropout at the side of a hemorrhage. It is probable that multiple factors and a complex mechanism contribute to their development. So the question here is whether um, structural and functional damage occurs before or after a disc hemorrhage. They usually occur at the edge of a rim notch, suggesting that glaucomatous damage exists prior to the disc hemorrhage. But also the areas that develop disc hemorrhage are often prone to RNFL thinning and visual field defect in the follow-up. 
So according to these results, this hemorrhage and structural alteration may occur concurrently or within a very short interval in the process of optic nerve damage. We all very well know that IP reduction is the only effective way in reducing glaucoma risk or progression. So does lowering IOP decrease the development of a disc hemorrhage? It seems that disc hemorrhages are not dependent on IOP and they can be found in eyes with good IOP control, but progression may still persist. But because sufficient IOP lowering is inevitable in any glaucoma patient prone to progression, their presence warrants intensification of IOP lowering. A beneficial effect of treatment in slowing the disease has been shown in some studies. Unfortunately, commonly used digital imaging devices such as OCT, HRT, or GDX are not capable of detecting disc hemorrhages. Clinical optic disc examination is a valuable tool in the diagnosis, and, uh, but disc hemorrhages can be overlooked as they are very small. So optic disc photography can increase the probability of detecting these subtle hemorrhages, and it still remains the gold standard. The management of these patients needs a custom-made approach for each individual. In patients with non-glaucoma, a disc hemorrhage is a sign of active disease, and we should follow these patients carefully with closer follow-ups. In people with no history of glaucoma, these patients should be considered as glaucoma suspects, and they need a true investigation. Significant IOP reduction is the only treatment at present to prevent vision loss. Um, this hemorrhage plays an essential role in the prognosis of glaucoma and patients having this hemorrhage clearly have an increased risk of progression. So a careful clinical examination of the optic nerve is the cornerstone of the diagnosis. A close follow-up with frequent disc photographs, OCT and visual fields provides a better control. And hemorrhages cannot be prevented from recurring simply by lowering IOP, but IOP management is important for the overall visual health of the patient. It is clear that we must treat glaucoma eyes with this hemorrhage much more carefully than those without this hemorrhage. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Nama Hamel. I am a glaucoma specialist by training and at Google I work on a team that applies deep learning to medical images. These are my financial disclosures. Okay, so today I'd like to talk to you about three things. First, what does it mean to train a deep learning model? Then, once we've trained a model, how do we know that it actually works? And how does this apply to glaucoma? So in the past few years, there's been a lot of interest in machine learning models for healthcare. And you can see that the number of publication is up by a factor of 138 since 2013. And this is the same for glaucoma. When you search artificial intelligence in glaucoma on PubMed, you can see the same trend and you get 100, 244 results. So what does it actually mean to train a deep learning model? When we want to apply deep learning, we need three things. We call this the machine learning rule of three. We need an objective, which is what we want the model to do, the task we want it to perform. We need data. We want it high quality. Typically lots of it, we want it labeled. And we need a model to um, learn the task and perform it. So for example, if we want to train a model to, to detect whether a photo is of a cat or a dog, we need to show it <clears throat> lots of data, photos of cats and dog. We show the model and the model learns in the same manner. We can teach a model or train a model to detect whether a photo is of glaucoma or not. 
We take a lot of photos of optic nerves. We label them as glaucoma or not glaucoma. We show it to the model and the model learns. So we trained a model, but how do we know that it actually works? So what we want to do now we, is we want to evaluate and we want to um, test the model and evaluate how, how it performs. And we usually measure this, this performance using these metrics. AUC, sensitivity and specificity, and these are nicely visualized on the ROC curve. And then we also want to calculate the agreement between the model's predictions, these are P, A, B, and C, and the ground truth, the reference standard. Um, and for that, we calculate Cohen's kappa using this confusion matrix. And how do we do that? When we train the model, we have a development data set that is usually um, combined training and tuning data set, and we'll talk about that. And then we train the model on this set, and then we test the model's performance. We evaluate the model's performance using a separate data set um, that the model has never seen, and it only looks at it once. Um, and this is how we measure and um, come up with the numbers, the AUC, and uh, the other metrics that I showed you. So we trained the model and we tested it and we got an AUC of 0.95. This is excellent. Are we done? Is that all that we need to do? So the next thing we wanna do is we want to evaluate our results qualitatively. That looking at the numbers is not enough. Now we wanna see and try to see what the model is doing. And for example, we want to make sure that the model is not um, basing its predictions or performing very, very well on, uh, for example, images where there are laser scars that are really easy for the model to pick, or that the model is not picking up these um, notches, the camera notches, and basing its, its predictions on that, because that's not good. And to truly, truly evaluate the model's performance, we want to see that it generalizes. And generalizes means that we want it to perform as well as it does on the test set. We want it to perform on additional data sets from different camera types, from different locations in the world, from different populations, ethnicities, disease severities, ages. We want to make sure that when the model sees something it has never seen before, it can still come up with a good uh, prediction. And this one is, uh, this paper from 2017 is a good example of generalization. Um, the team from uh, Ting et al, they trained a model and the model did not only perform well on the primary data set, but also on 10 additional external data sets from different populations. So, so we trained a model and we validated its performance retrospectively on a retrospective data set. And we saw that it generalizes on additional retrospective data sets. But how do we know that it actually works in the real world? So the two, next, the two things we need to do next are one is we want to test the model prospectively. So we run prospective studies where we put the camera next to a screening data, a screening um, setting, next to a uh, nurse or someone who works at a screening setting, and we compare the two and we put it there and we wanna see how it works and if it works according to uh, the standard in that setting. And um, the next thing we wanna do is we wanna see that it actually um, integrates into the, the workflow of the clinic. So the model can be very, very good, but if it's a burden on the workers and if it doesn't integrate in the, in the workflow, and then nobody's gonna use it. So what about glaucoma and how does this uh, relate to glaucoma, apply to glaucoma? So glaucoma has a unique challenge because, and this is a quote from the United States Preventative Services Task Force uh, report for glaucoma screening. And I'll read it out to you. Screening for glaucoma is a difficult problem because it is asymptomatic, it has low prevalence, it is typically only slowly progressive, and has no agreed upon standard for diagnosis. And that is the main challenge we're facing with glaucoma. And this is a paper. This is a paper we published uh, in December, our work on glaucoma. And I'll walk you through what we did there and, and explain a little bit of the thinking behind it. 
So we had two goals in this paper. The first was to train a model to detect suspicious optic nerves from Fender's photos, basically to find what a referable disc is or find referable discs. And then we wanted to understand how glaucoma specialists decide which nerves are suspicious and which nerves aren't. So kind of de decipher the gut feeling um, that glaucoma doctors use when they, when they diagnose glaucoma. Now, this was built on our diabetic retinopathy work. So we already had lots of images from uh, diabetic retinopathy screening programs, and we had a labeling tool. And later, I'll show you a screenshot of what the label, labeling tool looks like. But what we didn't have was we didn't have glaucoma specialists, and we didn't have a good grading skill for glaucoma. So we looked at the available diagnostic guidelines, and these include the ICO guidelines and the EGS and the AAO and, and many more. Um, and funny enough, what we found was that they all point back to the American Academy of Ophthalmology's um, primary open glaucoma, open angle glaucoma uh, suspect guidelines. So uh, we decided to focus on these. And basically these are the features that are listed in the AAO's preferred practice patterns. Um, on how to evaluate an optic nerve. And I'll give you a hint, these are not very well defined. They're kind of descriptive and pretty vague. So what we did was we took these and we gave them to a group of three glaucoma specialists and we asked them to grade a bunch of images using these um, guidelines. And then we compared the results and we saw a lot of disagreement and a lot of different interpretations of the different um, features that are listed. So we asked them to to write down their interpretations and their uh, suggestions. And we um, did another round and we asked them to grade again and again and again. And we did this 10 times until we um, came closer and came up with a list of questions or a list of uh, definitions for what the different features are. And then we started the task of grading images. So we had the images and we recruited more graders. So we had 43 graders for this task. 14 of them were glaucoma specialists, 22 ophthalmologists, and three optometrists. And we asked them to grade 86,000 images for the different optic nerve head features that I showed you uh, above. And then after that, we asked them to give a, an overall assessment of their gut feel of whether this disc was um, suspicious for glaucoma or not using um, this score. And this score was actually, or the gut feel was actually um, tied to the clinical action we would want people to take, uh, or when you would want to take once you see the patient, right? And we asked them to think screening setting. So anything or any any disc that they were they thought could come back in a, in a year or two and nothing will be nothing will happen was a non-refer, and anything that needed to be seen, in their opinion, before one year was a referable optic nerve. So this is a, a summary of the different data set. These are the development data sets I just told you about. Um, and then these are the three different validation data sets we use. This is the number of images in each, in each uh, data set. This is how it was graded. And this is the um, re reference standard or um, ground truth that we used for this. So this was adjudicated by three glaucoma specialists, and I will show you in a minute what that means. And then these were two real life uh, settings. One is a screening program, and the ground truth came from the ICD codes and ICD diagnosis given in that screening program. And then the third one was a uh, from the glaucoma clinic in Dr. Shroff's um, charity eye hospital in New Delhi in India. And the ground truth here was from a full glaucoma workup that these patients um, received and the, the diagnosis that resulted. So how did the model perform? Um, as you can see here, when we uh, tested or evaluated the model on the, on the um, first data set, the AUC was 0.94, which is excellent. Um, and this is um, on the same ground, on the same uh, population and the same pool of images, right? But there's no leakage between the different sets. And then when we tested or evaluated the model's performance on the other data sets, the external data sets, we saw a little drop in performance, which is not surprising. Um, these are very different settings, different populations, different ground truths. But the um, 
the nice part or the um, very promising part is that the model that was performed on fundus photos only without any additional OCT visual field, any additional information, actually performed very nicely on a data set in which the ground truth came from a full glaucoma workup. So this is very promising. And then to our other question, how do, how do the glaucoma specialists come up with um, their decision or the gut feel? And also, how do the model and the glaucoma specialists uh, compare? Uh, we ran logistic regression models. And this, as you can see here, most of the features are on the same on this diagonal, which means the model actually picked up what the doctors were doing. Um, and this is very encouraging to us because it, it means the model is actually doing what it's supposed to do. If you look at this, this is the notch. And this means the fact that it's not on the diagonal means that the, the um, glaucoma specialists give it a higher, um, a more weight than what the model has learned. And, and we think the reason for this is because we didn't have enough um, positive examples for the model to learn. So just a word about adjudication. Uh, when we say adjudication, what do we mean? We mean that we give a, a group of three doctors a photo to grade independently. After all three of them are done, we send it to one of the doctors um, randomly to one of the three. And that doctor now has, has a chance to look at the photos, at the photo and all the grades from the other uh, doctors and either confirm their original um, grade or say something like, I completely missed that notch. And yes, there is a notch there or the other way around. After the first doctor looks at it, it goes to the second doctor and then the third. And then this can actually go on until there's full agreement. And we do that for diabetic retinopathy. But for glaucoma, what we found was that when we stopped the process here, so each doctor just got a chance to look at the photo one more time with the other people's grade, the results of that and of letting them go on forever um, were actually very similar. And we did see that when we did let them go forever, uh, we, we found 15 rounds of this is a notch. No, this is not a notch. Yes, it is a notch. I don't see a notch, uh, which is typical for glaucoma. And this is the screenshot of the labeling tool. And this is actually a screenshot of the labeling tool doing an adjudication um, task. And you can see that G1, 2, and 3 are the different graders. The asterisk here means that this is me, the person looking at this, this is G1. And here you can see all the comments where the different graders can say where they see the notch, why they think one thing or the other. Now, why is this important? And why are we doing all this adjudication process? Um, the thing is that, uh, and we learned this during our diabetic retinopathy uh, work, which is where this uh, graph is coming from, that even when the guidelines are very clear, like diabetic retinopathy, where there's con general consensus around the uh, grading or the severity scale for diabetes, even when the guidelines are very clear, the labels and basically the humans are inconsistent, right? And you can see here that on the x-axis, we have the different ophthalmologists, and on the y-axis are the different cases or different photos. So each row represents once the collection of grades for one photo. And you see how much disagreement there is. And this is diabetic retinopathy. When we do the same for glaucoma, there's much more. And note that in this batch, the only photo that actually had full agreement was of a normal nerve. So that is, as I said, our biggest challenge in glaucoma, that there's no uh, consensus and no agreed upon guideline for diagnosis. And um, I want to finish with an example of, of, of uh, a different angle or a different way of thinking about this. And this is work uh, recently uploaded to MedArchive by Felipe Medeiros and his group. And what they were saying was, since um, we need a strong ground truth for machine learning, and for glaucoma, there is no objective reference standard. There's no consensus on reference standard for diagnosing glaucoma. And we cannot rely on the assessment of optic nerves by humans. And what they are suggesting, suggesting is basically to take the human out of the equation and look at measurements, objective measurements by visual fields and OCT. 
um, and then hopefully get more agreement and more uh, consensus. So this is a nice idea, um, very interesting and very curious to see um, if this will be adopted. So in conclusion, that deep learning is a promising tool for glaucoma, but uh, the challenge, there are challenges for deep learning in every field, uh, which are high quality ground truth data. And this is even more challenging in glaucoma. Um, and um, hopefully we'll get, we, we may find a solution for that. But in any case, for any, any area, validation and generalization are key in the performance uh, in real life of deep learning models. I have one question to ask Professor Nama Hamel. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. Okay. What do you think is the uh, biggest obstacle in development a robust automa automatic glaucoma diagnosis algorithm? Do you think the uh, difficulty to detect early glaucoma or the controversial definition of glaucoma? or something else? Um, yeah, so thank you for that question, because I think um, the, the biggest, biggest, biggest obstacle is the lack of definition. Um, machine learning, just like any other uh, science or study, garbage in, garbage out. And the machine will only learn what we teach it. And if we, we don't have a good definition, that's what the machine will learn, right? It, it will not. It will not come up with a better definition. Okay, one more. If you can choose one, only one modality of test to diagnose glaucoma with AI, which one would you prefer? Uh, um, that's a very good question. Um, personally, um, the work we do. Uh, focuses on screening and on bringing expert care everywhere. So um, it has to be a, an affordable uh, device or affordable technology, and we focus on fundus photos. Um, is, will that be, or will that turn out to be the best modality? I'm not sure. Um, these are two-dimensional images, and OCT, for example, has three-dimensional data. So it has much more data. The mo models trained on OCT may learn more. Um, so it depends what your end goal is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question to Dr. Zhang. Uh, yes. You showed beautifully that uh, the trend-based analysis in OCT can be uh, useful to detect uh, glaucoma progression. Um, how about event-based analysis in OCT? Uh, imaging um, compared to trend-based analysis. Uh, what What is your, your impression? Oh, yes. Thank you for the very good question. And uh, 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 today I, sh uh, I showed the uh, recent study uh, about the trend-based analysis, but in our glaucoma clinic, I always, I, uh, my uh, first, uh, first approach is to uh, detect the glaucoma progression is using the event analysis also. So uh, in my uh, impression, event analysis is also very sensitive to detect, detect glaucoma progression. But uh, when we are following up the patients, uh, the glaucoma patients in, in a long time, the trend-based trend approach can give us an about the rate, uh, glaucoma uh, progression rate. So we have more information about the uh, rate of the progression. So also I think the event analysis and trend-based analysis has some, uh, uh, has some a little bit different role, but, but I think, I think event-based analysis is also very sensitive to detect, detect glaucoma progression also. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question to Dr. Um, Ostoka. Um, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, previously, uh, we um, had a study uh, comparing uh, normal tension glaucoma and high tension glaucoma in um, 
regarding this hemorrhage. And we found that uh, this hemorrhage is much um, more frequent in normal patient glaucoma. Um, but our question was that uh, even uh, in normal patient glaucoma, the frequency of this hemorrhage is higher. Uh, we cannot always tell that the disc hemorrhage is IOP independent or IOP less de dependent. Um, because in, in normal tangent glaucoma, we do not know exactly uh, how the IOPs vary during night or um, during sleep. So what, what is your opinion on that? Um, is this hemorrhage really IOP less dependent or IOP dependent? Yes, uh, you are uh, actually right, Dr. Park. Um, uh, actually, we cannot totally say that it is not maybe IOP dependent or not dependent because um, in normal tension glaucoma, we don't know what is normal for that. Um, yes, in some studies, it is um, especially in a study of yours in recurrent hemorrhages. In your study, you evaluated that the IOP low IOP decrease is maybe related to recurrent disc hemorrhages in a group of patients. So um, yes, it may be IOP dependent, but uh, I think uh, future studies are needed to evaluate this relation. Um, uh, and we don't even know what is normal tension glaucoma, actually, the exact mechanism. So. Um, uh, there are some hypotheses about the formation of a disc hemorrhage, so we have a lot of questions about this. So, um, yes, you, you are right. Thank you. I agree with you. And I have a, a question to Dr. Hamel. Um, recently, there are many, many papers regarding deep learning in glaucoma, and most of the, the papers are using um, fundus photography. How about applying deep learning in uh, OCT images? Uh, what, what is your view on that? Um, thank you for the question. Um, so we have no experience in our group uh, using machine learning on OCT for glaucoma specifically, but um, we do have experience using uh, machine learning or deep learning uh, on OCT images, for example, for um, AMD, for example, um, mm. our, our team in London, right, the, uh, the, from, from DeepMind published on that. So there is no reason why not to use it on OCT uh, and why it shouldn't work at least as well as it does on, on Fundus Photos. But um, probably just like in real life, just like in clinic, the combination um, will give the best results. Okay. Thank you. Any any more questions? Um, th there was a question from the audience that uh, to question to Dr. Um, Gustavo de Mores, uh, which uh, OCT instrument uh, is he? using but dr de Morel is not in this uh, online discussion maybe maybe he's he's using a serious um OCT, but i'm not sure um any any i, of I think topcon but topcon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. i think i think yes yes mm -hmm. some probability map was from topcon right you're right Because he's in he's in Colombia and Dr. Donald Food is using SSOCT by top um, Any any questions about the myopic glaucoma presented by Dr. Song? We have we have many myopic eyes, um, but the difficulty is in in highly myopic eyes, as Dr. Song shows, um, highly myopic eyes 
um, may have changes in not only in the peripapillary area, but also in macula area. So um, asymmetry analysis in GCIPL may not work in very, very highly marked eyes. I, right. I agree. Yeah. Any yeah, some of the uh, macular images are distorted and uh, images, uh, we don't have sufficient quality for uh, signal. So in that case, uh, it would be, as I emphasized in my talk, it would be better to see more carefully on the optic disc itself, but it's quite tough. Uh, in clinical practice, we are sometimes we have to quit or abandon our OCT images in high myopia. So not all high, high myopia images, but many of them are disqualified. Right. Mm -hmm. I have a question to Dr. Shulan Zhang. Mm -hmm. um, you, you showed the review on the uh, anterior segment OCT. Um, so in future, is that uh, anterior segment OCT will uh, replace gonioscopy? Uh, what What is your view on that? <laughs> Very good question. Actually, we just finished this project about the uh, uh, trying to use the uh, uh, ASOCT to uh, to classify the open and and uh, narrow angle and also try to figure out the syndicate of the angle closure. We, we, we finish this paper, we, we begin to submit it. Hopefully in the future we can, I, we, we hope can uh, use this uh, ASOCD can replace the uh, gonioscopy to, to look at the angle. So I believe but, uh, you will, will work well. But it's a very difficult disorder. Um, indentation gonioscopy uh, using interior segment OCT. In future, yes. maybe. But, yes, we, we, this project we separate two parts. The first part try to use the uh, ASOCT to figure out the open and the narrow angle uh, based on the uh, gold standard of the gonioscopy. And then second part is a very difficult part try to use the ASOT to look at this Nikia. That's very difficult to do. We, use, we only do this part, we, we spend almost one and a half hours, uh, and yes. To, so for, uh, combine the, the first part, second part, that is the study gonioscopy and the eye attention gonioscopy two part. We try to, try to replace the uh, gonioscopy in the future. This is our goal. So the paper already finished. I try to try to submit it. Okay. Any comments or questions among speakers? And um, we we have we have uh, time to ask the question. We still have time uh, to ask the question. We have about seven minutes from now. Yep. Okay, let me ask uh, Professor Song. Song. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. You you know in clinical very difficult to diagnose a glaucoma with highly myopia, right? right very difficult, right. especially the person not not high, less than twenty one. So, uh, in your study, how to def uh, definition this kind of this kind of patient to diagnose the glaucoma with higher myopia? Yes, it is sometimes very difficult to uh, differential diagnosis from myopia and myopic glaucoma. So uh, practically, I think most important part is the eye is progressing or not. In many of the cases, when we follow the patient without any treatment, but the patient, the, the eye remains very stable. In that case, if the patient has the characteristic glaucoma to subject change, but we don't have too much worry about the patient. So I think the most important part is to, to monitor the patient very closely or very carefully. Uh, with whatever tools we can use, we can see macula, optic disc, RNFL, and sometimes vessel density. 
in any area, but the important part is the the eye is changing or not. I think that's oh. more important for the diagnosis itself. For the MTG, you will use the eye drop to drop down the uh, eye pressure further. But the patient with the highly myopia, <laughs> just like MTG plus highly myopia, when you use the eye drop to drop IOP too, because you can, you're difficult to diagnose this. Right. If the patient has a visual field change, I prefer to use eye drops. But if, if the patient has a change in the uh, structural assessment, but no functional de uh, defect, I usually prefer to follow without medication. But it, it depends. Uh, it depends if the patient has risk factors like family history or IOP fluctuation or high teens. I can use the medications. What about you? You have many normal tangent glaucoma, right? Hi, my mm -hmm. patient in China also, oh, right? We do. Yes, but I agree with you. We are we are uh, running a uh, RCT right now. Professor Kim mm -hmm. Ho joined our project too. To try to look at yeah, this kind of patient. We use uh, one one group we use eye drug, another one didn't. And then we'll see long-term uh, progression, so that we can answer this question: This kind of patient should be should use the idea or not? That's very That's important very, study. Yeah, uh, very difficult to do. Okay, yeah. three months only recruits six patients. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. can we finish uh, two hundred sixty patients? <laughs> <laughs> So if there is no further question, I would like to summarize our session. Um, at the beginning, uh, Dr. Gustavo Dumores uh, has uh, presented uh, about structure function relationship and Dr. Um, uh, Shulan Zhang um, shows pros and pitfalls of um, OCT imaging, and Dr. John presented uh, about um, progression analysis in uh, OCT imaging, and also um, Dr. Uh, Song uh, presented about um, myopic glaucoma, how to diagnose and how to differentiate um, in, in myopic eyes. And also Dr. Um, Ostopper, uh, she uh, showed a um, beautiful uh, review on the disc hemorrhage in glaucoma. And finally, uh, Dr. Amo um, showed very hot topic about uh, deep learning in glaucoma. So we uh, today we we had great uh, talks about imaging in glaucoma, and I'd like to thank all the speakers and our chairs and audience. Thank you very much.